Today's lesson is on the sometimes symbiotic and often tense relationship between the institutions of church and state during period three. Around the world, the period between 600 and 1450 CE was one which is often referred to as an age of belief, and rightly so. People felt a strong connection to their religious traditions and often saw no reason why their religious institutions shouldn't have some influence in secular political institutions. At the same time, though, these people did not want their political institutions to influence their religious ones, as this, they felt, raised the question of who was really speaking from their churches or temples. Was it God, or was it their king? So today, church and state, tensions between spiritual and political leaders. Now, as we've already discussed in class, the Islamic world in period three had embraced a system which intermingled church and state. The leader of the various states, whether caliph or sultan, worked with the spiritual leaders, the imams, and governed primarily according to Sharia law, as you've read in your textbook. There were, of course, exceptions, such as the hierarchy that established the taxes for dhimmi and kafir, but on the whole, Sharia law was the order of the Islamic world. In other parts of Eurasia, the relationship between church and state was not as well defined. In China, there was definitely a close relationship between Confucianists and the imperial state, but Confucianism occupied a status halfway between a religion, with its own rituals and sacred texts, etc., and a philosophy. Confucian principles had certainly helped to establish and maintain the strict social hierarchy that kept the emperors in charge, but it also allowed the people to practice traditional forms of worship, such as ancestor worship and Taoism. Up through the Sui dynasty, China then didn't have a recognized state religion. In fact, during and after the Han dynasty, a variety of foreign religions diffused to China, always along the trade routes. Buddhism came first in the first century CE, but then Zoroastrianism and Christianity arrived some time after the fourth century, and later Islam, which remained centered mostly in coastal urban areas after the seventh century. Out of these, though, Buddhism would make the biggest impact in China. By the time Buddhism diffused to China, Buddhists had a long history of monasticism, whereby men and women chose to live in communities, monasteries, separated from the world at large, to pray, to study, and to hope to achieve enlightenment. While they lived in these monasteries, they often traveled in search of teachers and to go on pilgrimage. It was they, along with merchants, who diffused Buddhism throughout East Asia. They built temples into caves and mountainsides, as can be seen on the picture at right, which also helped to diffuse Buddhism. The branch of Buddhism which diffused to China was called Mahayana, or Great Vehicle Buddhism, which believes that deities, called bodhisattvas, could help believers achieve enlightenment. This denomination of Buddhism attracted attention because the Chinese were interested in Buddhism's high standard of morality. Remember, a high standard of morality was already expected through Confucianism. And they also liked its promise of salvation, which was understood by the Chinese to be a version of the immortality that Taoism promised. Of course, and perhaps inevitably, despite Buddhism's growing popularity, it did clash with traditional Chinese cultural values. For example, Confucians placed great emphasis on practical matters, such as maintaining hierarchies and family ties. Buddhists, on the other hand, pondered metaphysical topics such as salvation. Buddhists also encouraged serious practitioners to live a celibate, monastic lifestyle to maintain their morality, advice which clashed with the Chinese ideal of moral living, which was filial piety, and large, multi-generational families who could continue worshipping family ancestors. In response to these tensions, Buddhism and China syncretized. Chinese Buddhists began by blending their beliefs with traditional Chinese vocabulary, and thus traditional Chinese values. For example, instead of referring to Dharma, which for Buddhists can refer both to the state of nature and the teachings of the Buddha in explanation of the laws of nature, Chinese Buddhists referred to Tao, which for Taoists also intertwined with knowing nature and its path. Perhaps in order to further assimilate Taoists, who had few written sacred texts, a new school of Buddhism, Chan Buddhism, emerged, which, like Taoism, emphasized meditation, intuition, and sudden flashes of insight in their search for enlightenment, as well as the ability to pray to bodhisattvas for help. For example, this image at the bottom right is of Kuan Yin, an East Asian goddess of mercy and sometimes included in the Taoist pantheon. She becomes a bodhisattva in Chan Buddhism.
Additionally, to appeal to Confucianists, Buddhists modified their suggestions of celibate lifestyle, teaching instead the Chinese families could send one son to the monastery while their other children raised families. This one son, as a monk, could pray for his family and bring salvation to ten generations of his family's descendants. In addition to this syncretism, Buddhist acceptance probably also grew quickly due to its monastic tradition. Chinese Buddhists established monasteries throughout the countryside and accumulated estates thanks to donations from wealthy converts. These lands were cultivated and the surpluses stored, and then they were used to feed local residents during times of famine or drought. In other words, Buddhist monasteries served as a welfare system. By the time of the Sui dynasty, beginning in the late 6th century, Buddhists had gained acceptance throughout the empire, and some Buddhists were even serving as government officials, a position traditionally reserved for Confucianists. However, it was the reunification of China during the Tang dynasty which coincided with the golden age of Buddhism in China. In particular, the reign of the Empress Wu, who died in 705, contributed to the acceptance and spread of Buddhism. In a bid to maintain her supreme political position, which was unusual because of her gender, she sought to undermine rival noble families who tended to favor Taoism, and some of the more powerful bureaucrats, who were, of course, Confucianists. So she converted to Buddhism and encouraged the spread of Buddhism as a way to weaken her opponents. She endorsed the building of Buddhist temples and monasteries, and she ensured that the lands under Buddhist monastic control were tax-exempt. They didn't have to pay taxes on the land they owned. Following her example, many devout Buddhists donated land and money to these religious centers, which, again, served partly as a social welfare system. Other Chinese used the Buddhist tax exemption as a tax shelter, as a way to protect their own wealth. Through special contracts with various monasteries, they donated their lands to a temple or monastery so as not to pay taxes on that land, but then they retained control over those lands, and they could tell the monasteries how to use, or not use, those lands. The Empress Wu and her immediate successor also used Buddhist festivals to celebrate their reigns and achievements, further mingling Buddhism with traditional Chinese beliefs. So it looked as though, at that point, Buddhism would be a success in China. By the middle of the 9th century, however, Buddhism was persecuted by Tang emperors. This reversal may have been the result of backlash against Empress Wu, who was widely viewed as having usurped the power of her third husband, whom she'd succeeded. But the backlash may also have been in part because of Buddhism's foreign roots. Some high-ranking officials began questioning the adoption of a barbarian cult over Chinese-grown religious and philosophical traditions, as well as the growing and sometimes ostentatious wealth of Buddhist temples and monasteries. Certainly the extreme influence of the Confucian bureaucrats played a role in the backlash against Buddhism. As Buddhists had replaced some bureaucrats as confidants to the monarchs, the Confucianists had grown tired of being shoved aside, and they began to argue that the Buddhist monastic establishment threatened China's imperial order, and that the Buddhist clergy was conspiring to overthrow the Tang dynasty. In 845 CE, the Emperor Wu Zong, a Taoist with many Confucian confidants, closed most of the nearly 5,000 Buddhist temples and monasteries in China. Those monks and nuns who had entered the monasteries, about 300,000 of them, were forced to return to living outside the monastery, and they became peasants, subject to extreme taxation where once they'd been tax-exempt. While it seems that Wu Zong's primary motivation was indeed political, it's also possible that this dissolution of Buddhist monasteries and temples had an economic component. These wealthy institutions had lots of precious metals, which the Tang emperors wanted and needed to maintain a good economy. Wu Zong and his successors were able to bring the wealth of the Buddhist monasteries into their own treasury and confiscate the lands as their own. Chinese bureaucrats after this time were now almost exclusively Confucians, as elements of Buddhism were purged from the Chinese government. While the emperor could enforce a return to Confucianism among his officials, doing so among the people was much more difficult, and Buddhism not only remained within China, but it also spread to nearby states, such as Japan. By the beginning of period three, Japan was both similar to and different from the Chinese Empire. While China was already an empire, the Japanese had just started to unify under the leadership of the Yamato clan. But the Yamato did use a Chinese import, Confucianism, to help them establish and maintain a political hierarchy. The Japanese, like the Chinese, had long practiced ancestor worship. But in Japan, ancestor worship was a formalized religion called Shinto, or the Way of the Deities. 
Shinto practitioners believed that, after death, a person's soul became a kami, a local deity. Oh, under the Yamato clan, the Japanese worshipped both their kami and the Yamato ancestors, which gave the Yamato clan even more power. Additionally, the Yamato emperors, and emperors after them, claimed to be descended from the sun goddess Amaterasu, the primary Shinto deity and creator of the Japanese islands. I hope this image of Amaterasu reminds you of the Japanese flag. The rising sun right in the middle of that field of white, the sun goddess. Do you get it? In the 7th century, Buddhism, in the form of Chan, or as it was known in Japan, Zen, spread to Japan and, as it had in China, syncretized with Shinto. However, in Japan, unlike China, the emperor himself was seen as an object of worship thanks to the believed descent from Amaterasu, and so in Japan, Buddhism would have to adopt this sensibility as Shinto already had. So, in Japan, both Shinto and Buddhism worked to continue emphasizing the divine nature of the emperor, which kept the social and political hierarchy working fairly smoothly. However, it's possible that one reason why Buddhism remained welcome in Japan was because of Japan's political organization. While the Japanese used Confucianism to establish a hierarchy, the Japanese government was very different from China's. In China, the emperor embodied all aspects of the state, its legislative and judicial order, making laws and deciding disagreements, as well as its military order, leading armies, etc. In Japan, though, beginning in the 800s, the 9th century CE, the government included a split between a public imperial authority, the legislator, the emperor, and a separate executor or agent of rule, the shogun, who basically served as a judge and as a military leader. While the emperor maintained his court, and often in a capital city separate from that of the shoguns, the shogun's job was to control a feudal state in Japan. The shogun ruled effectively through his vassals, the provincial lords, called the daimyo, who in turn depended on their vassals and soldiers, the samurai. Set up similarly to European feudalism, in terms of obedience and loyalty relationships, in Japan the real power lay with the shogun, who controlled these professional warriors. Like European knights, who practiced a code of conduct known as chivalry, the samurai had their own code of conduct known as bushido. Unlike chivalry, which basically governed obedience and loyalty and requirements to help those in need against invaders and kidnapping, etc., bushido also included the requirement of education. On their own time, samurai were expected to educate themselves, to become well-rounded men capable of both fighting to the death and engaging in a philosophical discussion. So, the samurai were not just a warrior class, they were an educated warrior class. So, if we were to summarize the relationship between church and state in the Far East during period 3, we'd probably conclude that the major continuities from the previous period include the continued use of Confucianism to order governments, along with the continued use of traditional native religious traditions such as Taoism in China and Shinto in Japan. The introduction of major foreign religion, such as Buddhism, had mixed results in the Far East. In China, Buddhism was ultimately rejected by the government because it went against traditional Chinese values. In Japan, however, Buddhism didn't challenge Japanese values, and so it remained an important religion and was embraced by the government. In the end, in the Far East, unlike the Middle East and, as we'll see, unlike Europe, religious institutions just didn't have that much influence on political institutions. But then we get to Europe. As I mentioned, undoubtedly because of the adoption of Christianity as the Roman Empire's religion in the late 4th century, church and state were more closely linked in Europe than in the Far East. Another reason why this may have been was simply because of organization. The Christian church throughout Europe and the Near East was an institution and was formally organized as such, unlike the religious traditions of the East. For example, in the early centuries of Christian diffusion, the disciples of Jesus of Nazareth, who led single churches or congregations, came to be recognized as priests of the Christian church. Over time, greater organization was needed, and so some priests were given authority over multiple churches in a given area, called a diocese. These more influential priests were called bishops in the West and patriarchs in the East. That said, the bishop of Rome is special. One of Jesus' apostles, Peter, had gone to Rome to establish a Christian church there, 
As his authority grew, he became a bishop and, as leader of Jesus' apostles, was seen by some as the de facto leader of the entire Christian church. When Peter was executed by the Roman state, his successors in Rome continued to be called bishops and were considered by many, mostly in the West, as the successors of Peter and leaders of the Christian church. Thus, over time, the bishops of Rome became the father, papa, or pope, of the Christian church, at least for the Christians of the West. Some devout Christians chose to isolate themselves from their communities so that they could live a life of prayer in dedication to God. The development of Christian monasticism may well have been influenced by the tradition of Buddhist monasticism. Christian missionaries probably encountered Buddhist monks and nuns as they diffused Christianity. Unlike Buddhist monasteries, though, Christian monasteries were cloistered, completely separate from the outside world and self-sustaining, as you can see from the images at right. The men, called monks, and women, called nuns, who chose to join a monastery, lived lives in service to God. They were led by either an abbot for the men or an abbess for the women, who organized work and prayer schedules and who interacted with the outside world on behalf of their brothers or sisters within the monastery walls. While monks and nuns were technically clergy, they were someone outside of the traditional hierarchy of both the church and medieval European society. In fact, women who joined a monastery often had more rights than women outside monastery walls. They learned to read so they could pray, and write so they could keep records. They lived generally free of male interference, except for their local priest or bishop, who served as their own priest, and could occupy leadership roles, such as that of the abbess. Monastic lives notwithstanding, by 600 CE, the Christian Church had also developed a clerical hierarchy, a hierarchy for the clergy, which was both social and political in nature. Let's start at the bottom of the hierarchy to get a sense of how this worked. We've already discussed priests and bishops, who originated as disciples coordinating the spread and worship of Christianity in the early years of Christian diffusion. In order to become a bishop, a man had to be ordained a priest first, so all bishops are also priests. An office below that of priest, the deacon, also developed. Deacons served as helpers to the priests. They maintained records, they helped organize and celebrate the Mass, the Christian worship service, and they helped priests keep up with the demands of helping their congregations. As the Christian world grew larger, greater organization was required. Archbishops, who controlled multiple dioceses, were put in charge of coordinating the work of the various priests, bishops, under their control. As archbishops also controlled the church lands in their various dioceses, archbishops could be very powerful and influential political figures as well. Again, all archbishops began their rise up the church hierarchy as priests. So men at this and higher levels of the church hierarchy were often related to noble families so that they could get a lead up in moving up the hierarchy. And they often had not just spiritual and religious influence, but also political influence thanks to their families across Europe. Over time, some archbishops received a new designation, cardinal. Generally speaking, cardinals helped to coordinate the papal bureaucracy both in Rome and throughout the Christian world. They were in charge of overseeing the work of archbishops and also often served as diplomats from the papal court to various European states. Cardinals were also the priests who were eligible to elect the pope. And finally, at the top of the pyramid, we had the Pope, or the Pontiff. That's why we call a papal reign a pontificate. Traditionally also the Bishop of Rome, the Pope led the entire institution of the Christian Church. As Pope, tradition held that this man made final decisions regarding doctrine, or teachings, and dogma, or beliefs, of the Christian Church. In practice, he depended on the advice of his closest advisors, usually both cardinals and archbishops. The image you see here, of the Triple Crown, is the official papal crown. The three levels indicate the Pope's authority. He is above a king. That's just the first level. He is above an emperor. That's just the second level. He is a spiritual authority. That's the third level. In fact, this is good symbolism for looking at European medieval artworks. If a person is wearing a single crown, he or she is a king or queen. If they're wearing a double crown, that indicates that they are an emperor or an empress. And of course, only the Pope wears the triple crown. The Pope was, however, also a secular ruler. He was the Duke of the Papal States in Italy. So his authority was both spiritual, and he was influential throughout all of the Christian world, and political, 
particularly as the ruler of the Papal States. As you might imagine, this dual role caused some conflict between the Pope and secular rulers in Europe. However, this landed wealth also caused increasing problems. As strong kings emerged in Europe, especially after 1000 CE, they became interested in the church's wealth, and they were often related to the high-ranking clergy members. These connections made them willing to interfere in church affairs. They named, sometimes successfully, bishops and archbishops within their territory. In fact, in 1049, Pope Leo IX became pope in part because his second cousin, who just happened to be the Holy Roman Emperor, wanted him to be pope and endorsed his election. While there were increasing tensions between religious and political leaders across Europe, the first real significant break with the Christian Church occurred between the two halves of the Christian world. There were a variety of disagreements at the heart of what would be the Schism of 1054, and they ranged between both political and religious issues. In the political sense, Eastern bishops, again called patriarchs, had long disagreed with the idea that the Pope was the undisputed head of the Christian Church. They preferred to make important decisions as a council, and to have the chairperson of that council, the Patriarch of Constantinople, announce these decisions. They didn't feel that the Bishop of Rome, they didn't even call him the Pope, had any special status. Additionally, Western and Eastern clergy disagreed on an important element of dogma. In the East, they believed that the Holy Spirit was sent from God the Father. In the West, the belief was that the Holy Spirit was sent from both God the Father and God the Son, as implied in the Gospels. In the West, Christians had revised the Nicene Creed to reflect their belief in 450, and had added what was known as the Filioque, and the Son, clause. The East had continued using the original Nicene Creed, and they refused to accept the revision. Pope Leo IX and the Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicated one another for their perceived unorthodoxy on these issues. Excommunication is a banishment from the community, so each of these church leaders banished one another and all of their followers from their respective churches. The end result of these excommunications was the creation of two large Christian denominations, the Roman Catholic, which means Latin Universal Church in the West, centered, of course, at Rome, and the Greek Orthodox, meaning Greek Rite Teaching Church, in the East, which was centered at Constantinople. And one would think that that was enough drama for one century within the Christian world. But you'd be wrong. Even as the new denominations were dealing with the fallout of separation, each were also dealing with the increasing influences of political leaders within the Church's business. Now, in the East, and since the time of Constantine, it had been understood that the Byzantine emperor had a vested interest in the church, so he had been able to be involved in major church decisions. When the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, the Western clergy no longer had to deal with the influence of the Byzantine emperor on their business, and they became accustomed to running the church's institution all on their own, with little input from secular leaders. However, as monarchs began gaining power after around 1000 CE, church leaders in the Roman Catholic Church had to deal with increasing pressure from secular leaders across Europe. This pressure bubbled over in 1074 with the investiture controversy. Investiture is the process by which a priest is ordained to higher clerical office, such as that of a bishop or an archbishop. This investiture was decided upon by the Pope and usually accomplished by either the Pope or his direct representative in the various kingdoms and empires of Europe. However, beginning in the 900s, some monarchs had started investing their own choices as bishops and archbishops, and the Pope was angry about it. This Pope, Gregory VII, wanted to initiate a series of reforms within the Church's institution, and securing papal jurisdiction for investiture was one of those reforms. This reform didn't go over too well with the new Holy Roman Emperor, a kid, he was only 23 years old to Gregory's about 54 years, named Henry III. Gregory's reforms were supported by the clergy, as well as the majority of Europe's commoners, who didn't like to see politics involved in the choice of spiritual leaders, so he moved ahead with them. Henry protested, but faced revolts from some of his territories. Remember, the Holy Roman Empire is really a confederation of states, and they didn't all like Henry. He appealed to Gregory to speak out against the rebels, but Gregory refused. Henry, angered by Gregory's silence, tried to remove Gregory as pope by kidnapping and so the conspiracy goes, assassinating him. That's what the cartoon at the bottom left of the slide illustrates. It didn't work. Instead, Europe was horrified by what Henry had tried to do, and Gregory excommunicated him, 
On top of that, Henry continued to face revolts. Henry finally realized that he'd have to beg forgiveness from the Pope in order to stop the madness, and he did just that in 1077. Gregory lifted the excommunication, and Henry was able to get his empire under control. But none of this resolved the investiture issue. In fact, the investiture issue wouldn't be resolved until 1122, almost 50 years later, when an entirely different pope, an entirely different Holy Roman Emperor, agreed to a compromise. The pope would remain the person who chose men for investiture, but the emperor could veto a pope's choice. This rarely happened, but it was a power that the emperor had. By the end of period three, by the end of the Middle Ages, most monarchs in Europe had earned this veto power that the Holy Roman Emperor had had. So the end result of the investiture controversy was actually a reduction in the power of the Pope. And of course, you'd think, two such dramatic incidents would be enough for one century. Oh, but you'd be wrong. In the late 11th century, the Seljuk Turks began to expand their territory. They conquered the lands that had once belonged to the Abbasid Caliphate and established their old Sultanate. By the 1070s, they were challenging the eastern borders of the Byzantine Empire. After a couple of defeats, the Byzantine Emperor decided to appeal to his fellow Christians in the West for help, so he sent a letter to the Bishop of Rome at the time, Urban II. Urban's response to the letter was undoubtedly the result of his own goals. Remember, first, the investiture controversy is ongoing at this time. Second, this letter came about 40 years after the split of the Christian world. Urban saw this as an opportunity to reunify the church. Additionally, there was the added benefit of spreading Christianity. For Urban, this was a win-win-win. So, he delivers a sermon at Clermont in France, in which he calls for the men of Europe to take up the cross to defend their fellow Christians in the East. This sermon sparked the Crusades, a series of wars in which European Christians sought to forestall the expansion of the Muslim sultanates and to retake the holy cities in the Near East, which had once belonged to the Byzantine Empire, a Christian state. It's important to know that there were many Crusades, but a few major ones specifically directed toward the Middle East. From the Christian perspective, only the First Crusade and the Second Crusade had any real success. The First Crusade liberated the Holy Land from the Seljuk Sultanate, and various Latin kingdoms were established in the Near East to protect these cities from the Muslims. The Second Crusade was focused closer to Europe. It drove the Muslims from Portugal and thus liberated a portion of the Hispanic Peninsula from Muslim control. Subsequent Crusades were less than successful. The Third Crusade, featuring King Richard the Lionheart of England and Salah al-Din, or Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt, was a result of the Muslim takeover of Jerusalem. Although the Europeans failed to retake the city, they did manage to ensure pilgrimage and trading rights for Christians in Jerusalem. The Fourth Crusade didn't even make it to the Near East, although it was supposed to. In 1204, the crusading army, who'd officially been hired by the Byzantines, but who was upset about not being paid, sacked the city of Constantinople. The Crusades, altogether, were a perfect example of the often violent interplay between church influence and political agenda. In the end, those who benefited in some way from the Crusades were the secular leaders who already had power and influence. Let's go ahead and look at the impact of the Crusades briefly, so that we can see why this series of wars was so important to later European developments. Among the causes of the Crusades, we have, of course, the expansion of the Seljuks, which marks the first time a Turkish Muslim group will gain control of a large territory. The expansion of the Seljuks threatens the Byzantine Empire, which prompts the emperor to send that letter. In the West, the Pope sees this letter as a chance to right the wrongs of disunity, a chance to spread Christianity, and maybe even a chance to end the investiture controversy. So he uses his influence to call up men to go to war. This showcases just how influential the Pope could be. He certainly controls his own army as Duke of the Papal States, but his own army isn't big enough to challenge the Seljuks, so he uses his spiritual influence to get other political leaders on his side. And he does. Those political leaders, though, joined the Crusades for their own reasons. Some of them were undoubtedly religious, but many of them wanted the potential expansion of territory and potential riches that war could bring. So the Crusades began. The effects of the Crusades are much more wide-reaching than its causes. As we might imagine, tensions increase between the various monotheistic communities. Muslims and Christians obviously feel the tension because of the wars, but Jews are caught in the middle, sometimes supporting the Christians, sometimes supporting the Muslims, based on their experiences with each group. 
Between crusades and after them, however, the sultanates grow less tolerant of the dhimmi, undoubtedly as a result of the experience of war. As a result of that, even the dhimmi are now faced with conversion efforts, and their taxes are increased. The dhimmi have a harder time getting good bureaucratic positions within the sultanates as well. That said, the increased trade that results from the Crusades has beneficial effects, particularly for Europe. Europeans get to import a variety of goods, yes, but most importantly, ideas from Asia, and especially from the Muslim world. New mathematics and astronomical ideas, new strategies for business. They even get to import Arabic translations of ancient Greek texts which had been lost to Western Europe for centuries. Ultimately, these new ideas will help to usher in the Renaissance, which begins in Italy in the 1300s. Finally, the Crusades continue that process of centralization for many European monarchs. The experience of getting large armies together, marching them across Europe and into the Near East, this allows monarchs to put procedures into place which allow them to gain power within their kingdoms. Further, this increased power comes at the expense of religious leaders, whose influence in world events is decreased. It's as though the Church is blamed for each loss of the Crusades, as opposed to the political leaders, the military leaders, being blamed. So now, a review of church and state in Europe during period 3. The major continuity is the influence of the Christian church throughout Europe, thanks to the adoption of Christianity as the state religion of the Roman Empire. In the East, another continuity is that the emperor holds power within the church hierarchy. This is a development that does not continue in the West, as the church's hierarchy there is self-controlling. However, during period three, secular, non-religious rulers begin to centralize their power across Europe, and while this process is very slow, it does challenge the authority of church leaders in the West. In the end, over period three, we see the growth of secular power at the expense of church leaders' political authority. This was a very slow process, and it in no way challenges the religious and spiritual influence that church leaders continue to have in Europe, not just throughout period 3, but well into period 4. And there you have it, church and state in period 3.